Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom is worth sharing. Wishing you a delightful listening experience. Today, the book I'll be interpreting for you is, The Silk Roads. From ancient times to the present, the Silk Roads have played a pivotal role in shaping the course of human civilization. When we mention, the Silk Roads, you might immediately think of the ancient trade route that originated in Xi'an, China, extending through the Hashi Corridor, traversing Gansu, Xinjiang, and leading to Central Asia. However, the, the Silk Roads, discussed in this book take a broader perspective, encompassing the region stretching from the east coast of the Mediterranean to the foothills of the Himalayas on the Black Sea's eastern shores. You might find it strange that this seemingly tumultuous and underdeveloped area, which includes present-day Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, and others, has been so influential in shaping human civilization. According to the author of this book, Peter Frankopan, this region, despite its current appearance, is the true center of the world. In antiquity, the Silk Roads served as a bridge connecting Eastern and Western civilizations, wealth, faith, and power, guiding the changes of the world for thousands of years. Today, this route still witnesses the struggles for oil resources, religious conflicts, and terrorism, each of which can trigger global turmoil. This region remains of utmost global importance. So, why is this book considered a new perspective on world history? There's a saying that history is written by the victors. The way we view history and civilization today is heavily influenced by the values of Western nations, primarily represented by Europe and the United States. This viewpoint asserts that Western civilization is the birthplace of world civilization, with the European continent as the center of the world. However, Frankopan argues that Western influence on the global stage only began with the age of exploration 500 years ago. Prior to that, Europe played only a minor role in world affairs, while the brilliant Eastern civilizations were the world's leaders. The Silk Roads, connecting the Eastern and Western worlds, has been the center of the world from ancient times to the present. Power and wealth struggles along this route have determined today's global landscape. Frankopan aims to overturn the traditional Western-centric view of history with the Silk Roads as the center of the world. Frankopan, a renowned British historian, is the director of the Byzantine Studies Center at the University of Oxford and an experienced expert in Eastern studies. He is fluent in Russian, has studied Arabic, and has had a lifelong passion for studying maps. He enjoys exploring maps from around the world, but he noticed that teachers seldom discuss historical stories beyond the European continent. This prompted him to delve into the research himself, satisfying his curiosity and sparking his interest in the Silk Roads, a route that has dominated human history and continues to influence the future of humanity. After its publication, this book received widespread acclaim, quickly reaching the top of the bestseller lists in more than 20 countries and earning recognition as the best book of the year from authoritative institutions such as the New York Times and the Times. In this audio segment, I'll explore this book from three angles, religion, wars, and finance. We'll discuss how the major world religions originated along the Silk Roads and the complex relationships among them, how this route played a role in triggering two world wars, and how the currencies and silver transported along the Silk Roads contributed to the downfall of the Ming Dynasty. Now let's delve into more detail. Let's start by looking at the first aspect, which is religion. It's absolutely undeniable that the Silk Roads can be seen as a path of faith. Major world religions, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, all have their origins along this route. Initially, these different religions weren't in opposition to each other but rather supported and influenced one another. Before the age of exploration in the 15th century, the influence of Islam far outweighed that of Christianity. For thousands of years, the Silk Roads served not only as a conduit for power and wealth but also as a hub for diverse cultural exchange and the extensive spread of religious beliefs. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and even Buddhism all found their origins in the city of Jerusalem, which was strategically located at the heart of the Silk Roads. This was a place where East and West converged, not only as a battleground but also as a gathering point for people traveling along the route. Different cultures and ideas collided here, merged, and quickly spread throughout the Silk Roads, providing the crucial conditions for the birth of these religions. In the early days of these religions, their differences were not as pronounced as they are today. Moreover, their collaboration and interaction were more extensive than they are today. For instance, Buddhism, born along the Silk Roads, originally emphasized a modest and unassuming form of worship. 
Still, it adopted practices from other religions to establish its own sacred sites, relying on the contributions of believers to construct pagodas and temples. They even borrowed elements from Greek mythology to create an image of the Buddha with a prominent nose, deep-set eyes, and curly hair, resembling the radiant sun god Apollo. This made Buddhism more tangible and contributed to its significant growth. Today, despite the apparent irreconcilability of Islam and Christianity, there are many similarities in their doctrines. For example, the Quran, the holy book of Islam, contains figures from Christian and Jewish scriptures, including Moses and Noah. It even acknowledges the existence of the Virgin Mary and Jesus. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, claimed to be a messenger of God. Given the relatively late emergence of Islam, there are suspicions of borrowing from other religions. Although this topic is sensitive today and often a source of tension between Muslims and Christians, it cannot overshadow the fact that the two religions once coexisted harmoniously. In the early stages of Islam, it received support from both Christians and Jews. Moreover, when we look at the historical development of Christianity and Islam, it appears that Islam held a central position on the stage for a more extended period. The military prowess of Islam's founder, Muhammad, along with his frequent victories on the battlefield and the substantial spoils of war he distributed to his followers, attracted a significant number of supporters in a short time, making Islam the dominant force on the Silk Roads. Controlling the Silk Roads meant controlling the economic lifeline between East and West. With significant wealth generated through trade, Islam entered its golden age. During this period, as the Islamic world thrived, innovated, and prospered, the Christian world in Europe languished. Europe remained stagnant for nearly a millennium during the resource-poor and spiritually stifled Middle Ages. For example, during the Middle Ages, a soldier wrote a letter back home, describing Great Britain as synonymous with coldness, loneliness, and hopelessness. In contrast, the Arab world at the time was a realm of flourishing talent and bright stars. Arab merchants traveled the world, and the center of the world was not Paris or London but rather cities like Kandahar in Afghanistan and Baghdad in Iraq. The Arab world was a fertile ground where merchants could accumulate wealth, and scholars received respect. This situation continued until the arrival of the Age of Exploration in the 15th century. Only in the past 500 years did Christianity manage to stage a comeback, and Europeans finally took center stage on the world scene. So, why do we now have the impression that Christianity represents advanced civilization, while Islam is seen as a representation of backwardness and closed-mindedness? It's because history is written by the victors. Once Europeans gained the upper hand, they began to romanticize and rewrite the history of the past. This included justifying their unjust conquests in the name of religion, such as the Crusades, which were, in reality, campaigns by Western Europeans to plunder riches from the East. These events were rewritten as civilized peoples campaign against barbarians, advanced Christians conquering backward and extremist Islamic infidels, and even romanticized the discrimination of European nobility. Due to the embellishment and rewriting of history by Europeans, the brilliance of the Silk Roads in world history not only faded but also devolved into an irrelevant history on the world's periphery. The author believes that when facing the highly complex issues of civilization conflicts and religious discord today, if you only rely on the history romanticized and rewritten by Europeans, you will have a difficult time identifying the roots of these conflicts, let alone finding solutions. The issue of faith thus becomes a global conundrum, even one of the most formidable challenges of the 21st century for humanity. To sum up this first point, the Silk Roads is indeed a path of faith. In the early days of the three major religions, they weren't in direct opposition. Competition among various religions along the Silk Roads was fierce, and only open and inclusive religions survived. Moreover, religions were not isolated from one another, and their learning, imitation, and exchanges far exceeded what we see today. This perspective appears somewhat inconsistent with the earlier point, as it suggests that religions were initially in competition with one another. Over 2,000 years since the inception of religions, Islam showed a more enduring vitality over a longer period, while Christianity was synonymous with backwardness, only making a recent resurgence in the past 500 years. Understanding this knowledge can help you see today's world issues from a fresh perspective, alright, now let's explore the second perspective, war. The Silk Roads were a path of conflict and served as the catalyst for two world wars. The turmoil in the Middle East today and the roots of global terrorism do not stem from religious conflicts, 
but rather from the seeds of discord sown by Western powers, led by the likes of the UK and the USA. You might be wondering how, given the history of Islam's contributions to advanced civilization, the Middle East ended up in its current state of turmoil. And where did the global terrorism that captures our attention emerge from? Did it result from Islam's shift towards extremism and violence since the 15th century? According to Frankopan, the chaos in the Middle East has no direct relation to religion. Contradictions between religions and faith alone wouldn't make two nations archenemies, rather, it's the pursuit of power and wealth that lies at the root of these conflicts. This is because countries along the Silk Roads had accumulated wealth over hundreds of years, including abundant oil resources. For instance, the cause of World War I was not European powers seeking to divide Europe, but rather Europe aiming to redivide Asia, specifically the region along the Silk Roads. In the lead-up to World War I, Russia had evolved from a barbaric nomadic tribe into an ambitious empire, with its sights set on British colonies worldwide, particularly India in the heart of Asia. India, rich and abundant, was like an automatic cash dispenser for the British Empire. As British power waned, European nations sought to get their share. Napoleon even declared his intention to oust the British from Asia. This time, it was the Russians they hoped to push out. The strong state of the Russian Empire had long been a thorn in the side of the British Empire, especially in the Indian subcontinent. At this point, it's worth noting that the abundance of India was akin to an automatic cash dispenser for the British Empire. As British strength waned, various European nations sought a piece of the pie. Pushed by these circumstances, England had no choice but to distract Russian attention away from Asia. The nations of Europe at that time, including France and Germany, had their own disputes. Additionally, Germany had maintained good relations with the Islamic world for a long time, partly because both sides harbored extreme anti-Semitic views. Russia's expansion threatened German interests in the Middle East, and so the British successfully diverted Russia's focus to continental Europe. This ultimately led to the shot fired in Sarajevo and the outbreak of World War I. The outbreak of World War II followed a nearly identical narrative, except that this time the focus shifted from wealth accumulation centers like India to oil-rich countries. Germany and the Soviet Union were both eyeing British interests along the Silk Roads, especially the oil-rich Middle East, which caused a second frenzy. The British, already weakened, had to play their last hand to compete for control in the East. While World War I and World War II were not centered directly on the Silk Roads, they were nonetheless ignited by the struggle for wealth and interests along this ancient route. The once dominant British Empire sowed the seeds of terrorism in the Middle East for the purpose of dividing and benefiting from the region. For instance, the British combined three predominantly Shia Muslim regions to create a new country while supporting a Sunni dictatorship. The deep divisions between Shia and Sunni sects within Islam were exploited, leading to irreparable internal conflict within this country, Iraq. Another example is the British support for the establishment of Israel in the heart of the Arab world, under the pretext of returning the Jewish people to their ancestral homeland. In reality, it aimed to control the local oil pipeline. This pipeline allowed the British Mediterranean fleet to travel the world, but the conflict between Palestine and Israel has left an enduring and unhealable scar in the Middle East and worldwide. Furthermore, to support a reliable puppet regime in Central Asia, the British repeatedly provided shelter and assistance to conflicting factions within Afghanistan. This intensified traditional power struggles in the country. In summary, troubled regions today, with a little bit of investigation, can always be traced back to countless connections with the British Empire. Though the British Empire may have suppressed the rise of Germany, Russia, and France, it couldn't control American dominance. Today, the carefully laid groundwork by the British Empire in the Middle East has mostly fallen into American hands. This includes various powder kegs planted by the British in the region. The United States has proven to be equally skilled at exploiting these conflicts, particularly by selling arms to control the Middle East. On one hand, the US can recover the dollar spent on purchasing oil through the sale of arms. On the other hand, it can supply weapons to hostile factions in the Middle East. Middle Eastern countries are reliant on the US to mediate between them since they are at odds with each other. Consequently, the US can exploit these circumstances to its advantage. Extreme factions equipped with advanced weaponry have contributed to the global rise of terrorism that we witness today. Therefore, when you grasp this series of background information, you'll have a deeper understanding of the ongoing turmoil in the Middle East and the spreading terrorism, 
which won't easily sway or confuse you. To summarize this second point, the struggle for wealth and interests along the Silk Roads served as the spark for two world wars. The roots of the Middle East's turmoil are not in religious conflicts but rather in the actions of Western powers, particularly the UK and the USA. The British Empire, in its efforts to maintain its interests in Asia, played a significant role in instigating two world wars and planting the seeds of terrorism in the Middle East. The more powerful United States, in the post-war era, inherited the British Empire's legacy in the Middle East and continued to use religion as a pretext, employing arms sales and the arms business to create chaos, terrorism, and seize oil resources. The aim is to control the global economic lifeline, and master the world's most strategic location, all right, now let's discuss the third perspective, finance. The Silk Roads were, in essence, the Silver Roads. Silver was, at one point, the primary currency for trade along the Silk Roads. Silver from around the world flowed continuously into China, where it was used to purchase goods such as porcelain, silk, and spices. This global trade, however, played a role in the downfall of the Ming Dynasty. When examining the Ming Dynasty's decline, whether through scholarly historical works or more engaging narratives, the focus often centers on internal problems, weak emperors, corrupt bureaucracy, and fervent peasant uprisings. But you might not have considered that beneath these factors lay the deeper cause of the Ming Dynasty's fall, the extensive mining of silver in the Americas. In China during the Ming Dynasty, silver had become the most important trade currency on the Eurasian continent. The world's silver was sent continuously to China, where it was used to purchase goods, similar to how the global financial trade today revolves around the US dollar as the settlement currency. The world's demand for silver naturally increased over time. At this point in history, Europeans discovered the largest silver mine in the newly found Americas. The refining techniques for silver also significantly improved during this period. Consequently, silver from South America was minted into coins on a massive scale and sent to the East via Europe, where it was used to buy luxury goods, various commodities, and spices from the East. With the ample supply of currency, the Silk Roads prospered, bringing wealth to countries along this route. For example, India reached the peak of its prosperity, with the lavish funds needed to build the Taj Mahal originating from the mining of American silver. European migrants flocked to Asia in search of employment. Of course, vast quantities of silver, like a ribbon, circumnavigated the globe, ultimately flowing into one destination, China. Frankopan believes there are two main reasons China became the ultimate empire for global silver. The first reason is that China had abundant resources, a stable political structure, and a highly developed society, making it the world's most significant producer of luxury goods such as silk and ceramics. China's vibrant and flexible private business sector could adjust production based on market demand and stably supply the world. Thus, there was no shortage caused by a sudden increase in overseas demand. And they most likely didn't engage in exploitative marketing strategies, which might have frustrated their customers. Stable supply sources and reliable products made it a favorite among traders. The second, and more crucial reason, was the imbalance in exchange rates between precious metals. Astute merchants noticed that despite the massive influx of silver, in China, the ratio of silver to gold remained stable at around 6 to 1, which was significantly lower than in places like India, Persia, and the Ottoman Empire. The price of silver in China was even double that in Europe. This meant that the price of silver was higher in China, enabling the same amount of silver to buy more goods and convert into more gold. Consequently, more silver flowed into China to profit from these price differences. Today, we commonly refer to this phenomenon as arbitrage in the financial world. Soros made a fortune by exploiting arbitrage opportunities in the global financial markets. The significant influx of silver into China at that time was equivalent to an enormous influx of hot money into a country today. The market suddenly had more money, resulting in ample currency supply, which brought about economic prosperity and commercial activity. However, as the colossal amount of silver continued to pour in, it inevitably led to rising prices and inflation. Inflation implies currency devaluation, which causes silver prices to fall. Simultaneously, the invisible hand of the market constantly worked to eliminate the price differences of silver in different markets. Eventually, the price of silver in China aligned with overseas markets. With no arbitrage opportunities, a massive amount of arbitrage-driven silver left the Chinese market, 
which is essentially equivalent to a massive outflow of hot money. During that time, China was grappling with inflation, where silver prices were falling, and demand for silver had surged. The outflow of hot money was a sudden and devastating blow to the economy of the mid to late Ming dynasty. In simpler terms, a financial crisis sparked by silver led to the systemic economic crisis of Chinese society. This crisis, in turn, caused a political crisis, ultimately resulting in the downfall of the dynasty. So, in a humorous summary, some suggest that it wasn't Li Zicheng who overthrew the Ming dynasty, but rather Christopher Columbus, who discovered the American continent, which led to the influx of silver. All right, let's do a quick recap of today's content. The first perspective, the Silk Roads are a path of faith. We revisited the fact that all three major religions originated in Jerusalem, and it was not a historical coincidence. This region is at the core of the Silk Roads, where the East and West intersect, giving rise to the collision of ideas and the confluence of civilizations. Different religions, in their early days, weren't bitter enemies, but instead supported and borrowed from each other. Only inclusive and open-minded religions could garner more support and survive. What might appear as backward or uncivilized religions or civilizations today may have represented advanced and long-lasting forces in history. To unravel the various conflicts today arising from faith, we must not be limited by contemporary perspectives. We need to return to the origins of faith and trace history back to make new discoveries. The second perspective, the Silk Roads are a path of war. We discovered the surprising connection between the Silk Roads and the two world wars. This route held a vital strategic location on the world map because of the natural resources and wealth it harbored, making it the focal point of competition among various powers. The more chaotic the region, the more opportunities some had to profit from it. This is also why the British sowed the seeds of terrorism in the Middle East. So, to solve disputes and conflicts in a specific region, we must analyze the problem on a larger scale. Terrorism in one place has a close relationship with another country miles away. The third perspective, the Silk Roads are a silver road. Financial crises are not just the challenges faced by countries today, the Ming dynasty experienced the severe consequences of a financial crisis long ago. We need to frequently change our historical perspective to make new discoveries and insights. This book, The New Silk Roads, might provide us with an essential perspective for interpreting Chinese history. The significance of the book, The Silk Roads, goes beyond helping us rediscover the Silk Roads. It provides a new angle to interpret the rise and fall of the world's history, the succession of new and old powers, and the redistribution of wealth and influence. More importantly, it opens up a completely new way of looking at the world. You may not agree with the viewpoints in the book, but this out-of-the-box thinking is what we should learn from and emulate. Innovation is not a quality limited to scientists and entrepreneurs, anyone who thinks and observes some everyday phenomena critically can make new discoveries and innovations. It might even open up a new world for our work and life. That's it for today's content. Congratulations, you've finished another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, audiobook channel. Like and share it with your family and friends, wisdom is worth spreading. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.